All right. I want to thank everybody for joining our webinar today on how to calculate customer lifetime value. My name is Jared Hillam, and I'll be moderate, uh, moderating today's call. So just a few housekeeping items. Uh, we have all the lines on mute so that you can uh, hear our speaker. And then towards the end, uh, we'll be answering questions through uh, the conference chat window. Uh, you'll be able to see that's one of the little bubbles at the top. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, go ahead and you know open up that chat window, type in your question, and we'll be sure to get to it, get to it towards the end. <clears throat> any questions that we can't get to during the call, we'll uh, we'll follow up via email or or send a uh, a note out to all the attendees. We're, we are recording today's call, so um, if you want to uh, share it with friends or what have you, we can uh, we can facilitate that. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our Katie Kleiner. Uh, he has over 25 years of experience in working with some of the leading data science and uh, management projects in the U.S. Um, and he has a unique mix of technical and business acumen, which is definitely necessary in obtaining that customer lifetime value metric. So without any uh, further delay, Arcadia, I'll hand the baton over to you. Thank you, Jared, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Jared said, the focus of today's conversation certainly will be on customer lifetime value. Um, we'll touch on a number of different things and, and share with you a number of different examples of uh, how organizations are using customer lifetime value to, to enhance their, their business position. So again, welcome uh, very briefly about Intricity. Uh, Intricity works with our clients uh, uh, to simplify complexity. And we do that certainly on the uh, analytical side, on the far right, as you can see on the business intelligence side, uh, but certainly in enabling uh, successful data governance and data warehousing programs to gather the data and make it possible to get to customer lifetime value calculations and certainly other, other types of uh, um, key performance indicators that, that are necessary to run and manage uh, um, a business. If you haven't seen this, this is uh, certainly is a, a very popular series that Intricity runs on, on our YouTube channel. So you can Google Intricity 101 and use the link that you see in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, over a million uh, views uh, to date and, and certainly growing, uh, but we answer lots of questions there around Salesforce, around data management, around budgeting and planning. Um, and, and certainly lots of uh, good feedback we've gotten um, across the board, both from business and, and IT. Uh, these videos are not technology focused, they're focused more on uh, specific business problems and how users uh, have uh, adopted uh, solutions, to, data solutions to, to manage those situations. Um, again, in, <laughs> this is a bit of a busy eye chart. Uh, the, this is a, a brief representation of, of companies where we've done business. The thing that's important to understand, and this certainly applies to customer lifetime value, um, the modeling that we do for CLV in particular, there are some specific models we use for retail. There are different kinds of models we'll use for healthcare. There are different kinds of models we'll use for CPG uh, or manufacturing because, again, the, the, the type of interaction with clients is different. And here certainly you see a fairly large cross-section uh, of uh, customers that we've worked with in, in the past. Again, um, this conversation is definitely about customer lifetime value, and that's what our focus will be uh, this afternoon. What's important to understand is whether your business is a B2C, so your, your business selling directly to consumer, and you certainly see some examples of that on the on the left side. Or if you're more of a B2B organization, uh, selling directly to business, and those businesses might ultimately be selling to consumer. Uh, these are some examples of customers, and, and as I mentioned, uh, it really cuts across from IT to manufacturing to media to retail to banking uh, to uh, companies that do packaged uh, products on behalf of other companies. So there isn't any one special organization that benefits from CLV. Uh, we really, as I said, have models that we've built for a variety of industries, and there's been a lot of success uh, in capturing specific business processes and then using CLV calculations to provide uh, tremendous value. 
So irrespective of where our customers come from, if they're direct consumers and we sell direct to consumer, or our customers might be other companies, uh, CLV, uh, customer lifetime value calculations, are applicable to both uh, types of organizations, both types of businesses. Ultimately, customer lifetime value is about acquiring uh, customers and ultimately retaining them. So as you can see, uh, some of the key values that we look at is what is our customer acquisition cost? And during our payback period, as, they, as we're interacting with those customers, what does that payback period look like? And when our contracts mature, if we're in a contract renewal business in this example, what does that look like? And will customers come back and will they renew their contract for another year? Um, these are really critical measures and they help us to prioritize and understand where we'll, ma we'll make marketing investments, where we'll make sales investments, and so on. How do we calculate CLV? So many customers that we've, we've come uh, to work with uh, have some ways that are not necessarily ideal for calculating CLV. So one example would be we look at average revenue per customer, we multiply it by 12, and that's our annual CLV number. Certainly doesn't give us uh, uh, enough uh, of accurate picture to be able to really pinpoint and understand what um, and where we should focus on, on our customers if we treat everyone the same. And so you'll see in the third example, we don't treat all our customers the same. When we do co uh, segmentation and we do cohort analysis, we do have an opportunity to segment our customers and understand them a little bit better. Many organizations have adopted very basic models. So RFM has been around for over 20 years, uh, and we'll talk about an RFM example in particular. But we've moved to models that are probability-based. They are based on Bayesian uh, inference engines. We look at econometric models. We look at persistence models. And ultimately, it's events that might be triggered, and so we use Markov chains to be able to connect multiple events to understand how CLV needs to be calculated. A lot of the work that we do with our customers is certainly to take the data that they currently have, but also to refine the models and, and back test them based on actual behavior of customers that we have in our, in our uh, systems. The old Pareto rule certainly holds true. We, we've seen this again and again, and whether it's 70% of uh, sales uh, come from 20% of clients, or as in this example, 80% of sales come from 20% of our clients, the question is, who are those clients? Uh, we have an example of a marketing manager who said that he's certain 50% of his marketing dollars were being spent appropriately. Uh, he's just not sure which 50% it is. Uh, and so again, CLV is a mechanism that provides access to that uh, accurate information to know where results are being, being derived from. I think another important thing that happens as part of our CLV calculation is that we work on dividing our customers into segments. And those segments may already exist in an organization. We call those segments sort of physical segments. But many times what we are more interested in also doing is looking at the data and seeing what data uh, tells us about our customers. And so it, a lot of times, again, segmentation is important because we want to understand customer lifetime value not only based on the entire customer ecosystem, but we'd like to know uh, segment A versus segment B versus segment C and how those segments perform. Ultimately, in this example or in this, in this slide, we talk about organizational value. And we believe organizational value is a combination of ability to attract customers, so customer acquisition, ability to retain customers, and ultimately to be able to expand and grow our customer base. And again, what, if you're a B2B or a B2C, it doesn't matter. A customer is a customer. And so we look at uh, customer lifetime value as a big contributor to ultimate organizational value if we look at uh, understanding what our uh, organization is worth 
it, it certainly customer is at the at the core of that uh, conversation. And in this example, we're showing marketing programs as a mechanism that helps us understand our customers. Um, we'll talk about the reasons that organizations, and many of you have joined this webinar, you, you, there are many reasons why you might be interested in CLV, and we'll talk about those specific examples together. This is just an example of one application of CLV. This is looking at customer churn. And so what this organization is trying to do is, is focused on uh, customers, and they're trying to understand what's the churn and how do we prevent churn? What opportunities do we have to, to make it so that our customers don't leave us? And if they are about to leave us, we'd like to understand who they are so that we are able to put programs in place that might be able to uh, keep them and, and keep them for another year or keep them for another um, cycle, whatever that cycle might be. So we'll talk about these formulas in a minute, um, and I, I certainly hope that I don't scare those who are on, on this WebEx with uh, uh, statistics and uh, uh, calculus. Um, but what's important to understand is why, first of all, did we join this call and why customer lifetime value is important to those of you who are, who are with us today. Um, for some organizations, customer lifetime value is a mechanism to understand effectiveness of marketing. So if we market, does our marketing affect our customer's behavior? And marketing today is many times real time. It's digital uh, based marketing. Uh, sometimes it might be the uh, print and, and other uh, campaigns that we might do via email. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is understand are our marketing programs effective? But it's even more than that. Uh, what we're trying to understand is what and who should we market to? So if we have a prospect list uh, or we have a customer list to be precise, and that customer list is um, a thousand customers, or it's a hundred thousand customers, or eighteen million customers, like one of one of our uh, clients. The question that they're asking is, who do I spend the money to market? Whether it be um, reaching out and sending a catalog, or sending an email. The other question is, if marketing for you means a highly paid technical executive that's part of a sales organization who needs to reach out to um, their customers by getting on a plane and flying and meeting with, with prospects uh, or with existing customers, I'm sorry, then we want to know that uh, this account executive, when she gets on the plane, she's, she's traveling to someone that we know uh, has a higher potential and a higher value to the organization. Many times organizations also are concerned with churn. So they may be in a competitive environment where there are potentially two main competitors and they're looking to keep and retain customers. And so the question that's being asked is, if I put an extra effort and spend money to keep a set of customers, I certainly can't do it for all of my customers. And so I'd like to know which of the customers should I focus my attention on. And so CLV provides that level of information. As we look at the data that we use um, and, and the information that we use to derive these calculations, it's also very important to understand that our um, CRM systems, our ERP systems, are incredibly valuable for feeding this information, but as you'll see, we also use them to feed data back into those uh, CRMs and into those customer service uh, systems. The examples that we have here, these are three different formulas, uh, and there are many others. We, we have now over 37 templates that we've built uh, for different industries for doing CLV calculations. In some of these examples, we have a situation where we'd like to be able to um, show not just the customer lifetime value, but we also want to subtract what our acquisition cost might be. And so the other thing that we look at is what's our discount rate? So in other words, if we are spending money to attract customers uh, over time, what's the value of money and how does that 
uh, figure into the equation. And again, the, these models get as complex as they need to be, but we always start with something that is reasonable and something that is well understood, and then we refine it and certainly help our customers uh, reach the best CLV calculation, the best CLV model possible. If we look at the one example of how we do uh, uh, customer lifetime value calculations, this example shows the RFM segmentation model. So it's the recency, how recently have our customers purchased from us. F is the frequency, so uh, how often do they purchase from us. And M is important, certainly, because it tells us the monetary spend, how much money was spent on those particular transactions. And so clearly, the focus that we're trying to do is we want to be sure that we are here and taking care of our customers to make sure that the high-value customers are certainly understood and treated well, and typically those are the customers that might have um, spe special phone numbers that they, uh, they dial in for tech support. They may have their own account reps that they work with. And a lot of times we have high-value customers not based on the actual data, but based on relationships. And so again, we're trying to not necessarily change that, but the data tells us a very different story many times in terms of who should be getting our attention. The other thing that we're certainly focused on is those who will be repeat customers. And so repeat customers are very important for us. We'd like them to come back, and we'd like to know what we're, what we're doing right to have them come back. And it is this segment here that is um, potential customers that have lapsed doing business with us or they haven't done anything recently with us. Those are opportunities before they move to the lost segment. We're trying to see if we can keep them in the, uh, from lost to, getting, to becoming, again, repeat customers. Um, and again, every organization focuses on high value, and we understand that but that may only represent 5% or 8% of our, of our business. And so it's the other 20% that we need to understand and understand how we can identify them and how we can retain them. So again, just more details on the RFM example. Um, what we do in this particular case is we look at the date of the last order, uh, and that is a very important predictor in some businesses. It's a very important predictor of how likely they are to reorder from us. And then we break data down into quarters. So we'll look at three years, for example, and we'll look at what happened in the first three months, second three months, and so on. And then we look all the way out to three years. We also may want to do groupings based on year. So we want to, again, depending on how long our customers stay with us, in some cases we're looking at a one-year uh, or two-year uh, CLV calculation. In some cases we're looking to a much uh, larger uh, time horizon. Frequency, again, it's very simple. How frequently have they bought from us? Did they buy once, twice, or three or more times from us? Um, and again, we're looking at those customers that are one-time buyers and a new, maybe we'll do something special for them. Maybe there's a coupon or an incentive, uh, or maybe there is an account rep who reaches out and does something special for them. And of course, monetary is important because ultimately we're trying to understand CLV is a measure. CLV gives us a, um, an, a dollar amount of how much a particular customer is worth. And so again, if we segment our customers by the CLV number, it gives us a lot of uh, competitive advantage in understanding how we will go into the marketplace and retain and pursue these customers. It also helps us identify who our most valuable customers are. So if we're looking to acquire new customers, what does the profile, what does the persona of a successful customer look like? Uh, and again, this is a very important conversation. Um, and as I said at the beginning, if you're in the insurance sector, it's certainly very important. If you're in the retail sector, it's very important. And if, if you're in CPG, if you're in pharmaceuticals, what doctors do we go after? Uh, all, what, what's important is the models may be different, but CLV is CLV. It's the customer lifetime value. And here on the monetary side, we look at low, normal, and high. 
and this is looking at the average order size. So very important to understand what our average order size uh, might be, and then we'll derive a calculation from it. Again, RFM is very simplistic. It's the most basic way of beginning to do customer lifetime value. And then we'll, we'll again do some things where we'll break things into cells. So we have the best cells might be identified as A's, and then we'll have B's, C's, and D's. And again, this is a mechanism for us to do some segmentation uh, with our customers. What's important to understand is that this is like a cake, and so this value can be enriched by adding additional attributes to the calculation. So for example, we may want to look at not just how much they've purchased, but what type of products they buy. Um, we also may want to look at demographic information. So we may want to look at our B2B customers and understand what segment of the industry do they represent? What's the size of their uh, employer base, uh, employee base? And we'll show you some sample reports in terms of forecasting and, and sales reporting. So here is an example of uh, recency and frequency calculation that shows uh, what happened zero to three months and what happened uh, beyond that time frame. And so here we look at catalogs that we mail to our customers. And of course we've changed the numbers here, but we look at the products and what products those customers have purchased, and we're able to see that the contribution of customers that are recent is um, $59,000, which is about 38% of the overall contribution. And then we look at the average order size, and then we look at how many, uh, what was the cost per, per thousand. So again, in this particular case, this was very, very helpful in understanding which segments of customers will we target when we do the next uh, uh, promotion, next big mailing. And then we break them into tiers. So we've got the A tier, the B tier, the C tier, and again, we're able to see um, what the breakout of the organization was. In this particular case, what we're doing is we're looking at year over year, and we're looking at how the organization has the breakout of year over year uh, across our organizational space. Most important with all of these calculations and the examples that I've used is how do we keep our customer lifetime value current? So there are some organizations that will do a CLV calculation and they'll do it only once. Um, there are some organizations that don't know what their customer lifetime value is and perhaps some of you on this call are in, in, in that segment. So again, the formulas that I showed should not scare you. Um, and what's important to also understand is that we understand how to get the data. And so in this particular case, we're showing only an example. If your data lives in SAP, great. If your data lives in Salesforce and we're getting social media data from Facebook and Twitter, wonderful. If we've got Oracle, if we're running Demontra, if we're running those kinds of applications, all of those are important sources of data for us. And so again, if we're sitting behind a desk in Excel and trying to do a CLV calculation, you certainly might be able to do it once, or you might be able to do it uh, twice, but as the data refreshes, the question is, what happens then? The other thing is that this shows a one direction flow. This data never makes it back to Salesforce, where it would be important for us to understand when I'm on the phone with a customer, is this a, an A, a B, or a C customer? or even to know what the actual CLV for this account might be. Again, we're in the world of personalization. We're trying to be more one-to-one -one with our customers. And so it's important to understand who are our best customers, because certainly they deserve um, perhaps a, a, a different level of service um, than, than someone um, that only purchased from us once. What we're doing is, with Informatica is taking data. So Informatica is a tool that's used for managing very large amounts of data and doing it so in a repetitive fashion. And so what we do, what Intricity does with Informatica is we are able to take, reach into these systems and pull that data out in order to arrive at a CLV metric. 
The other thing that's important is we want to keep the CLV calculation accurate. And so if this work is being done and we're trying to understand um, our customers, uh, in this particular example, is General Electric. And so with GE, what is the CLV for GE? And what we'll quickly discover is that GE lives in all of these places. GE lives in SAP. They, uh, they're represented in Salesforce. We certainly have some social uh, data that might be coming in. We might be doing, you know, Legility or Demantra planning uh, for our uh, GE account. And the challenge is there, there are at least four or five or 10 or 15 sometimes representations of GE. And so clearly, in order for us to have an accurate CLV calculation, we want to make sure that we understand that it, it is one GE uh, and what that organization means to us. And so the question for us is, which GE is it? Is it uh, each individually, or does it represent all four of them? So again, we may have um, GE1, GE2, GE3, GE4, uh, each buying from us. And ultimately, we want to know how much does GE spend with our organization. And so that value will, will be used as part of the CLV metric calculation. And that's true for all of our customers. So if you look on, on the far left, as, as you look to our, our customers as they're coming into our organization, and again, this is a manufacturing example, um, but it, it applies to other industries, of course, as well. And so the question becomes, what version of GE do we care about, and, and how do we look at, at, at that data? And so master data management, which is another important term in this, in this um, presentation, is our ability to understand we do have four versions of GE, but they ultimately are one organization. And so we use master data management to bring that data together to understand that we have one, one version of GE. And so irrespective of whether that data comes from Salesforce or SAP or Oracle, uh, we have a single, single view of the customer. And so clearly the focus here is what do we do beyond this call? I've talked a lot about the mechanics of how CLV is derived and what it looks like. And so Intricity has built templates, and these templates can be filled with your data, uh, and we can also certainly do um, models that are specific to your business or your industry. And so one of the key things, and Jared, who keynoted uh, um, at the opening, um, we're uh, proposing a three-week uh, focused uh, engagement, which provides three key deliverables the logical solution architecture, which shows you how the data flows through your organization in order to derive a CLV calculation. We do work around data profiling and getting the data from your source systems. So this is not theoretical, certainly. This is very, very practical. And then we build uh, a customer lifetime value model that you can use uh, and reuse going forward. So there are four uh, key things that happen as part of this call to action. We validate the goals. We identify uh, the data and pull the data from the appropriate source systems, uh, define the CLV model, and ultimately derive the CLV metric. Um, many times that metric, as I said before, um, can be used to feed your CRM systems uh, or your marketing engine to understand exactly who we are going to market to. Jared, I know that there are a number of uh, questions that have come in. Do you want to yep. um, identify them so we can we can start answering? Right. So, um, so a couple of the questions that have come in um, related to the costs, related to the CLV strategy engagement. How much does it cost to do? Is there a range or? Sure. So, CLV engagement, and, and this is a sample uh, of a three three week engagement. Um, ranges between uh, 57,000, I believe, uh, all the way up to 100,000. So it depends on how much data and where the data is coming from. Uh, in a typical three-week engagement, uh, it's, a, it's, a pro it's under $60,000 to get a CLV uh, model specifically for your business. 
Mm -hmm. There's another question about um, uh, can you talk to how to use COV and Net Promoter together? So that's a great question. So there are multiple systems that are used for doing uh, campaign campaign management. And so one of the key things that those campaign systems do is they're working on generating a list. And so as the list gets generated, many times the list is generated based on geography, based on industry, based on company size, based on a number of different variables that don't necessarily translate to what our customer looks like. And so with um, campaign management systems, what we look for is to understand, uh, unless you're a startup, if you're an established business, we look to understand how your customers interact with you today and what do they look like. What does an A customer look like? What does a B customer look like? What does a C customer look like? The, the persona that I, I, I talked about before. And so what we're doing is we're refining our marketing list. Um, if it's outbound email marketing, maybe we're less concerned about being super precise. But if you're doing follow-up, if you're doing, um, if you're calling on those customers after those campaigns go out, or if you're sending out pieces of mail, if there's a cost component that's involved with getting a catalog to a customer, or, and this is another very important example of CLV, I'm sort of reaching a little bit outside of uh, marketing uh, engines more into our Salesforce management. If I have 50 people in my sales organization and I'm able to uh, touch maybe three to five customers per week, which customers should it be? I don't have an elastic budget where I can hire another 50 sales uh, reps. How do I help those that sales organization understand what customers to touch first. And so it's a mechanism to, again, if you look at it from a cost savings perspective, certainly, but it's really a business optimization metric. It helps us drive our business to know if I'm doing a marketing uh, program with, with uh, a campaign system, what should the target list be? Or if I have mm -hmm. physically, if I'm going out into the field and meeting uh, customers, maybe it's physicians, maybe it's uh, my B2B um, purchasing uh, uh, groups. Um, my focus is to understand where do I focus my time. Time and then, is money. Oh, go ahead. So uh, can you talk a little bit more about the methodologies beyond RFM? Absolutely. So RFM is a very basic model. It's been around for a long time. Um, other things that we do today uh, much more focused on Bayesian algorithms. So these are neural networks that we built based on the transactional data that's coming through. We as humans are really good at looking at one or two variables and understanding those variables well. We use regression analysis, and so we look at the data to tell us the story. That story starts with segmentation to understand who those who our customers are based on it might be geographic segments that you've defined, but we're looking at actual data to tell us the story. Um, many organizations divide their uh, marketing into uh, regions or uh, industry segments, um, or they'll do marketing based on um, perhaps uh, seasonal uh, programs that they might run. Again, what we're focused on is running a machine learning algorithm to, through the data to tell us what the data needs to tell us. Um, RFM is dramatically different than that because RFM looks on only three variables. It looks at recency, frequency, and, and the monetary amount. So we look at those three things as well, but we're also looking at behavior. We're looking at transactional behavior, we're looking at weblog data, we're looking at transaction data, we're looking at, you know, has uh, this organization called our support center? If this is a maintenance-based um, organization looking to do maintenance renewals, contract renewals, um, there are certain things that we know about an A customer and how likely they are to renew our maintenance agreement. If this is a an insurance policy holder, um, you know, how likely are they to churn? How likely are they to leave the organization? If this is a, um, an organization that's buying 
um, in a CPG setting? What does that look like? Um, and so there isn't any one industry that benefits from CLV um, versus another. Um, certainly, if we have, we have customers that have one transaction that they'll do with customers per year. And so the first question that they asked of us is, well, if they only do one transaction a year, um, and we, uh, does CLV really matter? And so the first thing that we looked at was, what is their uh, renewal rate? And so they had 18% of their customers did not renew. And that's a very big number for this particular business, for this particular industry. And so CLV allowed them to focus and understand where they will put their account managers to help um, and keep those customers because we, we understood that it required a personal touch. Uh, and as we all know, personal touch is expensive. And then um, one question is, uh, can you do a proof of concept? Of course. And, and in some ways, um, you know, three weeks um, is a long time for, uh, for uh, organizations. And so many times we'll come on site, we'll look at the data, uh, and within the first week, by, by day four, we already know some of the key variables that are important and, and how, do we, uh, how do we build the model. Um, and then the question is, do we productionize it? Do we do back testing? What, what sort of work do we do? Another thing that's important to note is that we work with all systems, as you saw in the beginning. Uh, our choice of Informatica was very important because it allows us to connect to all data sources. There isn't anything today that we're not able to connect to. The other thing that's important to understand is that we, uh, this engagement um, manages the, the, the process. So the, the, the question earlier in terms of uh, beyond RFM, so we use languages like R to do, um, to do the analysis, to do the regression analysis. In some cases, we, we have our, um, our own uh, Apache Spark farm. We're able to spin up and feed data to it. Um, so again, depending on the volume metric, the size of your data set, um, we've got the appropriate technology to, to sort of build the model and make the model maintainable. And then uh, there's a question around, can CLV be predictive? Well, CLV is a predictive um, indicator. There is no question about it. Um, it is uh, predicting behavior. So if you remember the, the, one of the early slides on the far right where we had business intelligence defined, this is a predictive measure. So it's a measure that allows you to understand who and what did they look like. And so again, segmentation together with CLV is a very important measure to understand what uh, will happen, not just with existing customers, but also with prospects that look uh, and play a similar persona as those that uh, uh, might be your A or B customers. And then another question is, is there a yield management function to CLV? Um, so if the question is from the perspective, and maybe, maybe you can clarify um, what you're looking from a yield perspective, but typically the way that I would interpret that is if we were to invest X um, into a customer, what is our rate of return? What's our, what's our opportunity? And so depending on what we're doing to uh, the reason we're applying CLV, if the reason for CLV is to optimize marketing dollars, uh, certainly, if the reason for CLV is to optimize our sales organization and their focus, uh, certainly, if it's focused on product, uh, many times CLV is being used as a mechanism to understand product mix and what products are in our um, catalog, if you will, what, what of those products are most popular. And so CLV is also an early predictor of uh, behavior um, and, and certainly can be used to do yield uh, curves and yield calculations, and many times we, we do that, uh, especially in financial services. Um, then another one is, once you design the model, can the user refresh the model with key metric updates to get an updated CLV? Yes, and as you saw in the example in the middle, um, this, the focus here is not to have this static. Uh, for some organizations, it's enough to write, run the CLV calculation uh, maybe quarterly. For others, they'd like to run it uh, daily. Again, depends on what type of business you're in. 
Uh, we have some customers that run real-time CLV uh, metrics because it helps them uh, create uh, real-time digital offers. And so if you are um, doing digital marketing, real-time digital marketing, um, you certainly don't want this model to be you know, a year old. You want to be able to deal with current real transactions um, that uh, display uh, and, and show the customer. The other thing to note is you can build a CLV model um, that's very robust and very capable um, and not touch it for years and certainly uh, unless the business changes. But the focus of building a model and not just a, a calculation is that you're able to refine it and make improvements to it uh, year after year. And so again, um, uh, this, this model gives you th that ability to customize and to make changes to it. Yeah, and that kind of plays into this next question, which was, you know, how, how accurate is your model? And then um, they add on to that, uh, you know, what do you think the most challenging part is of the, of the concept of CLV? Again, two excellent questions. So um, the, the biggest challenge in getting a CLV calculation many times is a political challenge in terms of who will own the CLV metric. And so we've got some good uh, best practices around that. You know, does, does sales own it? Does marketing own it? Uh, does uh, IT own it? Uh, lots of those kinds of conversations. That's probably the most difficult part only because it's, it has nothing to do with technology and it has to do with politics. Um, the other side of the question, um, in, in term, Jared, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Uh, second was, was um, you know, what's the most challenging part of the CLV concept? Right, the challenging part we covered. What was the first part then? <laughs> well, the certain first part was um, uh, how much uh, or how ha how accurate is it? Oh, uh, how, I'm, I'm sorry. What's Thank the accuracy you. Yes. Um, I think accuracy is. Um, so we do a lot of back testing to understand if our data shows an accurate value. Um, if you do the most rudimentary implementation, and we have one very large customer that has done this with RFM, they're already seeing payback on the data that they're getting back. Our focus with uh, CLV calculations, while they can become very uh, complex and very um, sort of black box looking, uh, what we do is we do, I think, an excellent job of connecting the CLV with real customers and showing real transactions to demonstrate that the CLV calculation is accurate. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll uh, take 10, 20, 30, 1,000 um, samples and uh, present that uh, to executives who actually touch those customers. And so it brings CLV to life when you can actually touch it, feel it, and understand, first of all, how it was calculated, not the complex math, but what ingredients went into making that calculation, and why did the engine say that this is an A customer and this is a B customer. Um, and those things come through the engagement. So clearly, um, so we have the models built, and so we could take the model and someone can go off and, and, and use the model as is and purchase the model. But I think what's different here is it's not the mathematics that's complicated. It's the where do I get the data? Is the data of proper quality? Do I have good quality data? And again, Informatica helps us to deal with those kinds of issues. Um, but the other side of this is the most important part of the engagement, which is the people. We have the expertise, both industry expertise as well as uh, modeling expertise. So when we sit down with the ultimate owners of the CLV metric, they feel confident that they've got a, not only a good handle of, as to what CLV will be used for, but also that it's accurate and how it is defined. That has another important variable, which is, if you'd like to enhance it, so for example, we're able to get Experian data and get some demographic information we didn't have before. We understand that that gives us additional variables that we can begin to look at. And if the model didn't include it, um, now it includes it and we understand that it, we've refined it and can get even more accurate results. But again, CLV in one word is accurate. So uh, a couple of other questions. Um, 
Um, so one is, uh, how is this methodology used for a uh, for services offered by insurance insurance companies that do not have physical products to sell? I guess just to be sure we're covering the broad audience. You know, if it's a scenario where there's no physical product being sold, but rather it's uh, in a life insurance uh, where where there's no uh, cost of goods sold in such a way. Okay. Well, um, so if you use the uh, that specific example, because we do have an insurance customer and they they have actuaries that do calculate um, risk and and loss ratios. So for for us, um, a, an insurance policy or an annuity. Uh, or a financial in instrument that's being sold, whether it's a mutual fund or anything else, is a product. And as such, it has a cost. The cost of getting that product into the marketplace is both administrative cost in terms of managing that policy. It's also the inherent risk um, and what the risk uh, profile is of that particular customer that arrives a numerical number, how likely uh, the, the loss is to occur. And so we look at all of those variables to understand what the potential um, cost of the acquisition is, because again, we, we have to go out into the marketplace and find a customer. And then ultimately, if we keep that customer, we know what our, what our break-even point, if you will, to recover acquisition cost. And so CLV certainly is very appropriate for that type of case. Um, another question, uh... It keeps updating here with a lot of questions, so give me two seconds to find this. Um, can you uh, – let me go back up here. It keeps updating. Um, we have, so this is a company that has both B2B and B2C, and they're asking, you know, where do you start if you've got, you know, both of those models within the same, same organization? So the first question will be um, – why are we looking at CLV? What are the business drivers for CLV? Are the business drivers because we are um, having issues with our B2B uh, in, in terms of uh, retention or in terms of uh, cost to acquire? Um, what are the drivers around the CLV calculation? And usually it's pretty easy because if we look at what the priorities are for the organization for 2015 and beyond, their business drivers and goals that the organization has established. And so clearly we uh, at Intricity understand that CLV is one metric. There are many other metrics that the organization will deem to be key performance uh, metrics. And so CLV um, is an important metric to, to keep um, for, for managing the organization. Um, but again, we look at what the business drivers are and see where it's best to start. Uh, sometimes we look at it from a monetary perspective, where will be the biggest return? Sometimes we look at what's most aligned to what the business is currently doing. If we're focused on growing our B2C, uh, perhaps that's the place to start. If we're focused on, um, if 80% of our business comes from our B2B transactions, then perhaps that's the place to start. Okay. Um... All right, how, let's see, it keeps updating and pushing me back. Uh, okay, um, and, and this is a question that, it is a question that we usually take on a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I don't know if you could do it at a high level, Arcady, um, uh, and we can do outreach and, and talk with you about, about the specific formula, but the question is, could you elaborate on that infinite series formula and define the variables inside of it? Um, sure. So um, bear with me for a second. I can, I can sort of back up to the, the slide and, and get those definitions uh, for you and, and get the formula displayed one more time. And perhaps while you're doing that, you can answer also just one additional question. Um, someone said, uh, I have trouble believing that COV calculation slash methodology could be the same or even similar for products with vastly different return to market timing. For example, CPG like toothpaste versus an automobile. 
Uh, again, a great question, and the question, and the answer is, it's not that they're the same, that the CLV calculations are the same. Obviously, the monetary amounts would be different. The frequency of, of those purchases would be different. And so what we're looking for is we're looking for specific um, examples um, across the across the business. And so CPG certainly would be different than, than life insurance. But the value of CLV in terms of how CLV gets utilized is not different. You, you, it, it's driving your behavior in the marketplace in terms of either doing marketing campaigns or doing, uh, doing outreach. Um, I think I found the, the, I was able to find the, the slide back. Um, so, uh, in, if you're looking at the sort of the infinite uh, formula, um, what we're doing here is we're looking at D is the discount rate, M is the monetary account, um, R is the is the return or the value that we're we're arriving uh, with our calculation. And so, what's happening in this particular formula is we're looking at um, our uh, monetary return and we're looking at the discount rate. So for example, we know that our cost of uh, capital is 10%. And so we have to account for the fact that we have capital here anyway. And so what this formula represents is that we will discount our cash flows over a period of time so that we're accounting for that cost of asset or cost of capital uh, that might be in the marketplace. The reason that it's infinite, um, and so it's t, t is the time, of course, and so t from, from uh, one uh, to infinity and, and sigma. So we're adding these sigmas. Um, if you remember your calculus class, this is um, sort of the integral under the curve. We're doing little sigmas um, under the curve to try and understand the area under the curve. Well, that area for us represents the value of that customer. So it's all of those transactions uh, or possible transactions uh, that, that we might have. And the infinity tends to represent the fact that as long as we're in business, this formula will continue to drive uh, answers. And so we start off with time being zero. And many times we'll go back three years and look at the data as of three years ago uh, to get a good, good sample. Um, but again, that answer also depends uh, where do we start. Uh, if this is a brand new product that's just being launched and we've been in the marketplace for six months, clearly we want to compare it to products that are similar. Um, and we'll look at the first six months as the initial data set to, to see if we are uh, correlating, if there's a good correlation coefficient. But I think the other thing to understand is that the science of predictive analysis is a science. Um, you've seen the, the term data scientist. And so the, the value of having a data scientist sit down and look at the data and derive the calculations properly um, is really what this is all about. It's not about the formula because the formula, again, there are three here. Uh, there's, there, there are at least 67 others that, uh, that we have. There are 37 models we've built. But there are multiple formulas that, that sort of uh, get refined based on um, the quality of the data, based on the depth of the data, and also based on the industry. So um, to the question about industry, certainly we don't treat CPG the same way that we would treat pharma. So, so someone is asking um, just kind of a follow-up to the question, you know, how do you test that accuracy, um, you know, the accuracy of the model? Um, so the most effective way is for people who will be using it. So as I, someone had asked earlier, what's the most difficult part? The most difficult part is not getting the calculation in place. It's making sure that people are uh, comfortable and believe the numbers. And so we will do back testing, which means we, um, we've done our segmentation, and then we'll say if we take a customer of type X, Let's look across those customers and actually look at transactions and see if they follow the model and how closely, how many standard deviations uh, away from what we predict um, do those values fall. And so we're able to run through a backtesting mechanism, um, much like you would do in a stock trading model, uh, to see whether that behavior is, is more accurate. Unlike a stock trading model, customer behavior um, is much more cyclical and much more defined. 
And so if the goal, as I said, to predict churn, we're able to, with very high accuracy, predict how likely the customer is to churn based on transactions, not just physical transactions, but also transactions that don't happen. Um, they did not call the customer support center when the item was late. They did not do certain certain activities. Um, uh, we, do, we also rely on sentiment analysis, and so we're able to enrich these models with sentiment data in terms of what customers think of us. And again, the goal is to segment and to understand ultimately what the CLV is. A um, couple of other questions. Um, one related to uh, how how we would change the model in a scenario where um, cost is unknown. So, for instance, if the uh, insurance cost is different due to the fact that it, the ultimate cost of a policy uh, holder is unknown. Again, a great question. Um, so many times the cost may not be, um, all of the variables about the cost may not be known, but we have ranges. And so we sort of know if they fall into range one, range two, range three. So many times data sets that we look at have um, the accuracy of the cost is as well defined as it could possibly get. You know, we've got overhead calculations, we've got payout rates, and insurance uh, in particular, um, has a lot of well-defined industry metrics that we're able to rely upon. Actuarial data, uh, data from, from payout, data from our uh, risk uh, uh, calculations, again, commercial lines versus uh, uh, residential, if we're looking at property insurance. And so we have those, those numbers. And so obviously cost um, is an important driver. But if you remember the formulas, um, the the cost of um, p uh, policy payout is something different than a customer acquisition cost. And so if we don't know customer acquisition cost, those things we can derive based on our overhead, based on our, um, you know, uh, operating cost and, and, and those kinds of variables. Um, there's a question. Wait. Uh... Um, I got a lot of questions around. Can you share this presentation? And what we are going to—this is a recorded presentation, um, so we will uh, have the recording available that you can uh, you can reference in the future. Um, uh, one question here is: How important is delinquency when calculating CLV for retention purposes? So very important. Um, we have one particular example where it's a, it's a collection agency, so all the customers they deal with are, are typically delinquent. Uh, but even in, in that segment, uh, we know that just because someone is a delinquent customer does not make them a bad customer. Uh, so the cost of maintaining that customer might be higher, and so that variable because we have to utilize additional resources to collect, we have to send out letters uh, or use outside agencies, that cost, in, um, the, uh, that cost information will come in. And certainly recovery rates uh, will be very important as well. And so we may have five segments across our customers, those that are A, those that are B, C, uh, D. Uh, and so if we look at... Um, our e-customers, those that are typically delinquent, um, we can, because they're in a different segment, we know that they have other characteristics that we need to account for. And so if we see um, customers that are delinquent, we can certainly understand why their CLV numbers might, might be a little bit different. But the other thing that's very important is a lot of times we see similarities in our um, D customers that might uh, turn them into a delinquent customer. And so the, there, there are opportunities there to save and avoid the cost of collection. And so that's another interesting example of where a CLV can be utilized to uh, target uh, a particular group of customers to be able to reduce our cost to service. Cost to serve. And then now uh, another one is do you have experience working with retail energy providers? Another great example and another great industry. Uh, so the answer is yes. 
um, um, as we may not have said, we're, we're a national company, so there are 13 locations across the U.S., and so we cover U.S. Uh, quite well from west to east or east to west. Um, and so, yes, and, and the energy sector in particular is a very, very interesting one. As the deregulation and competition has increased, um, the ability to acquire customers uh, it becomes critically important, and to retain those customers becomes uh, very, very important. So monopoly situations uh, didn't have to worry about CLV. Um, and so to some extent, um, th there are still certain things which make it difficult for customers to churn. Uh, and so the other example that I would use um, is uh, cable providers. Um, so cable providers is another uh, similar example in terms of um, they may have within the same region multiple options. Customers may have multiple options. And so we're trying to, again, um, look at opportunities to upsell services um, and also looking for opportunities to certainly maintain uh, customers because the acquisition cost is quite high. So that, uh, that wraps up the hour. And um, uh, I want to thank everybody for for jumping on. Um, like I said, everybody who registered is going to receive uh, an email with, um, with a link for the recording. And, um, and we'll be doing outreach as well to, um, to discuss with you about the CLB strategy engagement and, um, um, and, and obviously you know, be able to go into a lot more detail, uh, specifically tailoring it more for your industry uh, versus sort of some of the generics we've discussed today. So, um, we, uh, we look forward to talking with you, and we appreciate your uh, joining our call. And, Arcady, thank you for, uh, for doing the presentation. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for joining.